To get started on this project, let's talk about supplies. So I absolutely am loving this Lindy chain. You can grab some over at crochet.com. We crochet is such a fun site. I love going on there and I found some amazing yarns. So this is Lindy chain, which is a 70% linen, 30% Pima cotton yarn. So perfect, perfect, perfect for any type of summer wear. And the color choices there are awesome. Today, this is the color I've chosen, which is what the pattern's named after and I love it. So pick up some Lindy chain, and then you will also need some scissors, some stitch markers, which I also found these on We Crochet site, um, and tapestry needle, and then my favorite hook to use, of course, is furls, and for today, you will need an H hook. So I'm gonna choose, yep, one of my faves. I love the Streamline. I also love the Odyssey. Honestly, I love all their hooks. But today we're gonna work with the Streamline. And just so you know, Furls also has this cute, adorable leather clutch to keep all of your awesome hooks in. To create this textured look on this wonderful summer sweater, we will be using an 18 row repeat. Now it's not difficult, it's just a lot of different type of texture stitches, but they are using basic stitches. But that first section I really wanna go over. So let's get started. I'm only going to be doing a 12 stitch repeat on, on this example, but follow the instructions in your pattern and start with however many stitches it says for the size desired. So chain the amount of stitches that it calls for in the pattern and then we will single crochet in the second chain from the hook. To do this, I always like to use the back humps. If we see our chain on this side, we'll get a lot of Vs that come down. I like to turn it over and work into the back hump of each chain. I just find it creates a cleaner look for the bottom. And where I didn't decide to put ribbing on the bottom, I like having that clean edge. Now it's important to know, especially in this first section, that your tension remains even and if somewhat loose. You do not want too tight of a tension because in the next row we will be working our split stitches and split stitches require that the stitches remain somewhat loose so that you can work into them for the next row. Now that I have my first row done and I have 12 single crochet stitches, yours will be a bit wider depending on the size you've chosen. And this is where we will single crochet into the first, but we're going to do a split stitch into that very first one. So what we do when we make a slip stitch is we are working into the upside down V right into the middle of this upside down V. And when we work into that, we are also splitting the stitch on the other side and working straight through that right side up V. So we will do a split stitch for the very first stitch and when you pull up a loop, just like when you single crochet, you kind of want to give your hook a little bit of a tug and pull that loop up a bit higher than you normally do. What this does is create space for the next row in order for us to get back into that stitch. Then we will chain one. Then we are going to single crochet into the next stitch the same way by using the split stitch. And now we will chain one, skip the next stitch, and split stitch into the next. And we'll repeat that across this row. Now this split stitch at first can feel a bit difficult. It's important to have a hook with a little bit of a pointed edge that can help you get into that stitch. If your hook is a bit rounded and you're really struggling, see if you have a hook in your collection that has a little bit more of a point. So in through the upside down V, yarn over and pull up a loop, and pull that loop up just a little bit more, and then yarn over and pull through both of the loops on the hook chain one and keep on going with that split stitch by skipping one and working into the next as a split stitch. This creates a knit like look fabric. We are going to repeat this all the way across and then turn. 
Now when working these rows, just because we're working with a fingering weight yarn, and sometimes it can be a bit difficult to keep track of these smaller stitches, I do like to take a stitch marker, and right after I create my first stitch of the row, I will mark it. And then when I turn and I start working the next row, I'll do the same thing. And that way I don't really have to think about it as much and I can make sure that my stitch count remains the same and I'm not accidentally increasing or decreasing on each row. Now turn and for row three, we're going to be repeating the, these steps. But for the first stitch, we will single crochet into the stitch through those Vs, just like doing the split stitch again. And then we will chain one and do the same into the next. And after this row, you can see a lot easier in order to do, work your single crochets into that V stitch, making sure it's working on the back side too. If you really don't want to work this split stitch, you can single crochet these rows. Just know that it might change your gauge slightly which means your shirt could be a little bit longer than the dimensions say. I don't think too much to worry about if you really, really don't wanna work this split stitch. So when we get to the end of this row, we will split stitch into the last two. And then we will turn and do those instructions again. So for row four, we repeat row two. For row five, we repeat row three. And for row six, we repeat row two. Still like to mark that first stitch. Sometimes I forget to, but it is super helpful. I'm now working row six, and as you can see, it gets a lot quicker and easier as you get going. You kind of get in a rhythm working the split stitch, and it's much easier to see the stitches once you've done a few rows. And as you continue on for the next repeat, you'll be a pro at it. So this is the end of row six. I'm going to take out that stitch marker and split stitch into that last stitch and now I'm going to turn. So with this work, you can see on each side, it looks like we've got a knit stitch running down the center, which is where we've got our single crochets working as split stitches and chains in between those. So it kind of makes somewhat of a ribbed fabric that looks that way, but it doesn't have that stretch. It is just simply a flat fabric. For row seven, we will simply chain one and then half double crochet in the first stitch. I'm going to go ahead and mark that stitch. And now we will half double crochet the next two stitches together, which means we will be, we will be working into the chain space and then the next stitch yarning over and half double crocheting those together. And then we will chain one and do the same thing again into the chain space and next stitch, half double crocheting those two together and chain one. We're going to repeat that until the very last stitch and on this very last stitch, we are simply going to half double crochet. Now we turn our work and we are going to just single crochet by chaining one and single crochet in each stitch across. I like to single crochet into the chain space versus trying to catch that strand. I just find it a bit easier. And 
And as we get to the end of round eight, we've just simply single crochet across. And now we will turn our work, chain one, and for row nine, we will simply half double crochet in each stitch across our row. And now for row 10, we'll end up turning, chaining one, and row 10 is repeating row eight. So we're just simply single crocheting in each stitch across. As you can see, many of these stitches are quite simple, but when we work them together in this 18 stitch row repeat, it creates such a nice texture. Now for row 11, we will chain one. And half double crochet in the first two stitches. Place my stitch marker in that first stitch. And now we will chain one, skip the next stitch, and then half double crochet in each of the next two. And we are going to repeat that across. So chain one, skip one, half double crochet into the next two. For row 12, we will turn, chain one, and we are going to repeat row eight, which is simply single crocheting in each stitch across. For row 13, this is where we're going to make just a few rows of a mesh stitch. So this one I think is really important to use your stitch markers because this is the one that's very easy to miss some stitches or get off on your stitch count without using those stitch markers. So we will chain one, slip stitch into that first stitch. Go ahead and mark it. Chain two, skip two stitches and slip stitch into the next. And we will repeat that across. Turn your work for row 14 and chain three. This counts as your turning chain and your first two stitches in this row. You will slip stitch into the very first chain space. Now what I like to do here is mark not the turning chain, but the second chain. So the first chain in the row. That's gonna count as my stitches. Then I'm going to chain two and into the very next chain space. So we're going to be skipping that slip stitch. We will slip stitch into the next chain space. And then when you get to the very last stitch, you'll have one slip stitch left we're going to go ahead and slip stitch into that slip stitch, keeping it loose so we can continue to work it on the next row. Then we will turn and chain row one. And for row 15, we will slip stitch into the first again. Go ahead and mark that stitch. And then we're going to chain two. And in the next chain space over here, we will slip stitch. And we're going to work that chain two and slip stitch across. And 
And then when we get to the last, we're going to want to slip stitch into that last stitch. Once you've single crocheted into the last stitch of now this we will row, turn our work this is a great time to take and a for stitch every count. Stitch, Go ahead and count the stitches across your row crochet. just to make so sure that you're on track. A single crochet if you're not, you can stitch. go ahead and undo a little bit and get the appropriate amount go of stitches ahead for and that mark row. It. Now we're going to turn and for row 17, we are going to repeat row 9, which is simply a chain one and then single crochet and into half every double crochet across. across this row, including your chains. So wherever your chains are, you're going to do a single crochet. And wherever your slip stitches are, you are also going to do a single crochet. Once you've single crocheted into the last stitch of this row, this is a great time to take a stitch count. Go ahead and count the stitches across your row just to make sure that you're on track. If you're not, you can go ahead and undo a little bit and get the appropriate amount of stitches for that row. Now we're going to turn and for row 17, we are going to repeat row nine, which is simply a chain one and half double crochet across. And now we've made it to row 18. So exciting, we are on our last repeat. So we will turn, chain one, and for row 18, we are actually repeating row seven. So then on row seven, it's chain one, half double crochet into the first. Go ahead and mark that stitch. Now we will half double crochet two together and chain one. Work the half double crochet two together and chain one across your row. And when you get to this last stitch, simply place a half double crochet. And that's it. You have made it through the 18 row repeat. And there's a lot of nice textures in here. This is what you will use to create the body and the arms. This is the texture stitch on all the pieces, all the main pieces of this pattern. So as you can see, when I pull out a section of this body, this is how it will look. We've got that mock knit stitch here, and our single crochet and half double crochet stitches, a little bit of mess, mesh stitch going on. And as we block this out, these stitches will really look nice. And so these are just simply blocks of repeats. When you get to the top, we will be doing some decreases to make some space for that neckline. We'll end up splitting in half and working one side of the shoulder and then simply working the other side of the shoulder. When we're doing this, I have instructions on how to decrease each row. And then also I like to include a little bit of stitch charts. Now, I don't know if you're comfortable with stitch charts, but I absolutely love them. It's a way for me to visually see what I'm doing. If you don't know how to read them yet, I totally suggest trying or at least looking at the written instructions and seeing how they translate to the written, to the chart instructions. And then the sleeves are also still worked in the stitch pattern, but we are increasing as we go instead of decreasing. So we will start with our beginning rows and I have instructions on how to increase evenly to create this sleeve. Now, if you did want your sleeve longer, you can, can continue to do that type of increasing, but remember you will also be placing a cuff on the sleeve. Now let's talk about the ribbing. I love working this style of ribbing. Now does it take a little bit of time? Yes, it does. But I enjoy the look of it. I like the stretch of it. I love that knit look, how it looks like a knit and a purl stitch in between. So let's talk about how to do this. To create the ribbing, you will chain the amount of stitches that the pattern calls for, either for the cuff of the sleeve or the collar of the neck. If you choose, you can add length on the bottom by creating a rib section just like this across the bottom. I chose not to because I kind of liked it the way as is, but I did waver on that a little bit. 
So chain the amount of stitches that you need for either the cuff or the neckline. Once you have your chains, you will slip stitch into the second stitch from the hook. And once again, if you want to mark your rows with a stitch marker on each side, just to keep that visual, it's never a bad idea. For this slip stitching, we also wanna keep our stitches a little bit loose. We do not wanna tighten up so much that we can't work into the stitches when we turn. So now that I've slipped stitch in each, each stitch across, I've got my first row. We will turn our work, chain one, and for this I do like to tighten down my chain a bit. I don't really want loose edges, so I will go ahead and tighten that chain down. Then we will be working into the back loops of the stitch. We will be working into the back loops of the stitch from now on. So if we look at the construction of a stitch on top, we have this V, this beautiful V. We've got these two strands that create that V. The front, the front part facing you is the front loop and the back part of the loop away from you is this. We will only be working in the back loops from now on to create this ribbing. So insert your hook into the back loop, yarn over and do a slip stitch. And remember to make your slip stitches not too tight. So I'm slip stitching across in all back loops. Now that I've created row two, I will simply turn my work, chain one and tighten that chain one down. And then once again, slip stitch into the back loops only. And that's it. For the rest of the length of the cuff, you're just slip stitching into the back loop only. So grab a movie because it will take you a little bit while to take to create these beautiful cuffs and collar, but it's not difficult. Just simply relax and slip stitch into the back loops and turn, chain one and repeat again. Now, as you're working your cuff or your neckline, be conscious to not be stretching or pulling on it as you're working it, because that will create a different length than what the pattern calls for. So we don't wanna stretch it to the length that it calls for. We want to not stretch it. I know it's tempting, I always wanna play with these. And we just wanna simply create that ribbed piece without stretching it and have it be the length that the pattern calls for. Now that you have your sleeve, let's go ahead and place our cuff onto the sleeve. We're going to do this in the same way that we did the, the collar. And if you need to pin it to make sure it's even, feel free. But we did make it slightly shorter than the bottom of the cuff because I did want it to stretch out just a little. So now here's where we can stretch it out just a little. Go ahead and pin the cuff to the bottom of your sleeve. And this is with the right side facing me. Now taking your tapestry needle, sew this on in the same way we did for the collar. And yes, I'm a little bit lazy here. I've got a lot of my ends still hanging out. Some of them I will use to attach to the garment. That's kind of why I also leave some of my ends hanging out and I'll cut them a bit longer. But these ones definitely could have weaved them in by now because I don't need them. Now that we have the cuff on the bottom of our sleeve, it's time to join our sleeve together. To do so, we're going to fold it in and then simply seam up this line to bring those edges together. Now,
The nice thing about seaming this t-shirt is it has so much texture to it that it's a lot easier to hide your seaming. As you seam up the sleeve, be conscious of the stitch patterns to make sure that you're lining up the stitch pattern rows to each row. So now that I have all of my pieces made, I have two sections of arms for the left and the right. I've got my cuffs for the ends of the arms, and I've got my front and my back, and then I've also got the collar. So let's see how to put these together. The first thing I want you to start with, which I did off camera because I couldn't help myself. I sometimes I play with this and I forget to record that part. But take the front and the back and we're going to seam them together at the top shoulders. So you'll simply seam together the shoulders as such. And this will help us start to know how to assemble the rest and how this is going to be shaped. So you notice when they're together here, we've got this nice neckline. And let's go ahead and put that on first. Now, the other thing I suggest for this, which isn't always needed, but for this pattern, I did find it easier. When you are sewing on this collar, I suggest actually using some pins. I mean, you can use stitch markers, you can use other needles, or if you are a sewer and you have some of those sewing pins around, go ahead and pin this on. The reason why is we created this a little bit shorter than actual length because we do want to stretch it out just a little bit. I like the look of it better stretched on the edges and it kind of pulls together in more at the neckline. So in order to make sure that this is stretched out evenly, we will want to pin on this collar. Now I have this cute little guy. He is found for free on my blog. He's a little dessert inspiration from one of my favorite restaurants. And he's the cutest little pincushion. I absolutely adore him. I try not to crave this key lime dessert every time I get it out, but um, he's fun to look at. And he is free on my blog and he's also used with yarn from We Crochet. So be sure to check that out and you can pick up this little guy and yarn to make him while you're picking up that beautiful Lindy chain. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to pin, I'm going to first lay out my collar. I find it easiest to open up the front and the back and have the collar opening just like so. And then you're going to take this and I want the seam to be at my shoulder, kind of hiding it a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and pin, first pin at this shoulder. Then I'm going to move across here and all the way around, stretching this evenly along that collar opening. It might be easiest to go by quarters, halves, and then pin in between. And what I mean by that is we're gonna pin the front, the beginning and the end here together on one side. And as we go around, we'll end up stitching these together towards the end and then take half equal across and pin on the other side. And then pin front and back. And that will help us get an even distribution of this collar across our neckline. And then if you would like, you can also add more pins as you go. I know these kind of slip out because it's not as solid of a fabric, but it just kind of gives you an idea of where you want to be. Then go ahead and grab your tapestry needle. I still have the, a longer tail end on my work here, and I'm going to go ahead and put that on my tapestry needle, and here we go. Now this is just like sewing anything else. You can choose to do a whip stitch, you can go back and forth, whatever looks best for you. I actually kind of like this edge overlapping, so I'm going to go ahead and pinch this and take out my first pin and simply attach like so. And now I'm going to be sewing up and down. So I'm gonna go down into my work and then come back up on the next row of the crochet. So it is catching and I'm leaving my neckline collar a bit above the work because I kind of like that 
texture it adds from one piece to the next. You can play with this and sew it on how you like, but the main thing is just to get it on. Now, as you get back to your starting point, taking out those pins as you go, you'll want to join the two ends. Now, you can do this before seaming to the main body. Um, there's really no difference if you do it before or after. You just have to make sure that everything sits evenly so that you're not short or too long once you get to the end here. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to seam these two ends of the collar together. And then we have a really nice collar on here and we are pretty much halfway to assembling this. Now that we have our sleeve seamed, it's time to attach it to our top. To do this, we can do one of two things. First, you can measure down from the top of your shoulder to the exact amount in the pattern of the depth of the sleeve. And then you can seam, leaving this part open, you can seam from here to the bottom. Or you can go ahead and attach your sleeve and then finish seaming to the bottom. For some reason, I like to pin it and attach the sleeve before seaming the sides. So what I will do is I will make sure that the top seam is sitting right where it's supposed to. I will make sure the seam of the sleeve is facing down, and then I will start to pin around and attach this into place, and then seam from here down. So now that we have our sleeve seamed to the main body of the top and we've seamed down the side, all we do is simply repeat these steps on the other side over here. So I've already got my cuff on my sleeve and I'm ready to go. I'm going to seam my sleeve and do the same steps by placing it onto the sweater and seaming the sides. And then this beautiful sagebrush Lindy Chain summer top is just so much fun to wear. I'm absolutely already in love with it. And I will say this yarn has a wonderful drape. I made it a bit wider so that you can wear it over a shirt if you'd like. I love the look with the white collar shirts underneath, but then it can also be worn as something more casual for the weekends for the summer. This is going to be one of my favorites this summer and I hope you enjoy it as well. Be sure to hit that like and subscribe button below and I cannot wait to see you again next time.